The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to bring someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I really enjoy talking to. He's kind of like our go-to lawyer for personal freedom and liberty. His name is Robert Barnes. Robert, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Glad to be here. All right. So, I mean, there is a lot going on right now. I've got so many questions for you. But the first thing I'd like to do, because I know you're part of the media as well, is kind of get your take on everything that's going on, not only from a standpoint of personal liberty and freedom, but also from a legal standpoint. And what I mean by that, I've been thinking through as we open back up a lot of business owners, what happens if they have someone come into their establishment that might get the virus legally, li you know, the liability. And then also when I'm seeing all these riots these store owners and everyone's out there saying okay well you got to go get a gun because you can't rely on the police but obviously that comes with a lot of legal ramifications i mean you just can't go around shooting people so i i just want to unpack all this yeah there's no doubt about it it's going to be a unique legal environment because you already had a a wave of insurance lawsuits about whether insurance coverage covered the pandemic so you've got businesses all across the country and insurance disputes. Every insurance contract is different. So you have some that have stronger or weaker claims, but the entire insurance industry is trying to not pay a penny related to the pandemic, even to long like owners of the French Laundry in San Francisco. When you're, when you're an insurance company and you're not willing to pay a high profile, uh, you know, someone that's covered under your contract, someone that, it, that when they file suit is gonna get a lot of attention, it gives you an idea that they're not willing to pay a penny. So that's gonna be its own legal uh, debacle. Then on top of that, you have questions raised about whether governments can be sued. There are class action cases all across the country on whether the governments uh, basically took property without just compensation under the Fifth Amendment. So those cases are pending all across the nation. And that was already the case before we have what's happening now. And they're trying to pass immunity laws in a bunch of states. In some states, it's about what happened at nursing homes because you had a bunch of governors send a bunch of old folks back. Basically, if you were infected, they told you to go back to the nursing home, the most vulnerable place possible. Of course, wow. it led to a lot of death. And of course, what the nursing homes want is they want the governments to give them immunity because at least in some of those cases, the state or city governments ordered it to happen. So, but they're also looking classic in these situations. They'll look for wholesale immunity across the board. And some states are passing it, saying anything that happened during the pandemic time period is now no longer uh, subject to suit, no matter how reckless, negligent, or even intentional it was. The same context is happening in, across the country as it relates to COVID-19 uh, or the cerveza sickness. Uh, basically, <laughs> <laughs> basically what they're, all the businesses are asking for the same thing. They're saying, we can't risk a customer suing us, an employee suing us, someone else suing us. There's already lawsuits pending by various uh, class action lawyers against some companies that employ people in their view without adequate safety measurements taking place. Uh, so they're, they are also seeking complete blanket immunity. And Mitch McConnell is considering it, giving it to them at a federal level, saying that they cannot be sued for anything related to COVID-19, period so that they feel comfortable enough opening up. Now, that's going to create its own risk, of course, in the sense of no reason to be protective if you can't be sued for what's taking place. But they basically, it's people who are saying our uh, economic harm outweighs the potential that some people will get sick through negligence who otherwise would not have. But basically, that's what's a lot of immunity calls across the board. There's governments considering either expanding or shrinking immunity now uh, on top of the riots. So there's uh, a call to pass potential bill passed in Congress that would strip qualified immunity from various police actors and government officials. I'd be all for that. Uh, we'll see whether it goes through. Uh, but on the other side, there's more cities and counties and states that are looking to expand their immunity for anything that happens during the riots. Uh, to give some context for this, back in the old days, what used to inhibit riots was every city who had a police force had to pay all the property damage that occurred during a riot period. Didn't matter if they did anything wrong. Riot happens. You have a police force. Police force job is to avoid a riot. If a riot happens, they got to pay every penny, nickel, dime, and dollar. To, so to you, business owners. Yes. Oh, so I you, didn't know that. So if you go back to like the old New York Times in the 1860s when they had a bunch of uh, Civil War riots in New York City, popularly portrayed in the Gangs of New York movie by Martin Scorsese. Okay. They, 
you could go through and they had like a long list of all the property that the city had to pay. So if somebody, you know, somebody lost a desk, somebody lost a, this piece of property, somebody lost this. So all homeowners and businesses. So if there was an arson, they had to pay for the whole value of the business. Uh, in the late 1960s, for the first time ever, so that was the law in the U.S., all the way through English time period, and then afterwards, all the way up until 1968, 1969. That's when they suddenly charged it. They, uh, after the Newark riots, they decided, let's change the laws so we can't be responsible for what happens. And so now a city really can only be sued if they try to interfere with the riot. Because if the riot happens and everything gets destroyed, the city's not on the hook. But if somebody interferes and somebody says they used excessive force, then they can be sued. So that's why there's a massive institutional incentive for police to do nothing when a riot occurs. And you can't get legal remedy for it. There are some people who believe that was politically done. There was, it was overwhelmingly Democratic governors and Democratic mayors who put these changes through in the late 1960s, okay. basically leveraging the power of the mob. It's almost like you know, it's, it's, it's 1800s French, France all over again. Whoever has the mob could have real political power. Uh, the mayor of Baltimore a few years ago even said this to a media person, admitted it. She, yeah, she wasn't the brightest bulb in the block. She just sort of let it slip by accident. <laughs> <laughs> she said, uh, you know, we need to create a safe space for the protesters and a safe space for people to destroy. <laughs> it's like, well, hold on a second. Did you just say that on the record? Uh, now, I think that's the one who ended up in jail for some other issues a year or two later. Um, but I think there's systematic issues with that. That's going to uh, produce its own litigation because there's already federal civil rights suits pending concerning what happened with the Trump riots in 2016, where people were rioting outside of Trump campaign events, San Jose, California, other places. And the issue was whether the police facilitated the riot occurring. Uh, I think you're going to have issues with that here. Uh, and then, of course, there's all the risk of how do you defend yourself during the riot? What happens if you defend yourself during the riot? As you've seen, a lot of store owners. Now, Korean store owners have become sophisticated at this ever since the 1990s. So during the 92-93 the Rodney King riots, right. uh, there were a lot of Korean store owners in the South Central. They went down and got snipers and manned the rooftops of their stores. Now, now, now wait a minute here. Uh, let me just... Let me make sure I'm following you here. They they literally hired people with guns to to sit on the rooftops, and if someone tried to break into their store, the person would shoot them. Exactly. In fact, they both hired people and did it themselves. But so how, they, how? But okay, from a legal standpoint, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I'm obviously not a lawyer. I, I I'm assuming that if someone breaks into your property and they're coming into your home or into your business then you've pretty much got the right to, to let them have it, whether it's through your fist, whether it's a gun, whatever. But if, they're, if you're outside of your property, it seems like maybe that the law would be different. How does that work? It all depends on the city and county and state you're in, and there's always a possibility of federal law influencing it. So because there's federal civil rights laws that can be in play, if the gov federal government believes you violated someone's civil rights, uh, a, a case example of this is the Arbery case. So there, now there's a little, you know, different set of facts, but they thought of themselves as defending their property and executing a citizen's arrest. At least and that's their... And what happened there? So Ahmad Arbery, what happened was he's the guy that they said was jogging through the street. Uh, two guys in the truck jumped after him and purportedly shot him in cold blood. That was the initial uh, story, media narrative. The okay. back story is... The, you had a neighborhood that kept having uh, burglaries. The New York Times reported over 80 911 calls in less than three months from that, just that little neighborhood in Georgia. Uh, the, there was a retired policeman who lived with his son that was considered sort of the community watch guy in the neighborhood. There was one home that was, seemed to be the centerpiece of various burglary activities, and the, but the owner, because he was an absentee owner where part of the property was under construction, he uh, put in video cameras because somebody was constantly entering the property and, uh, and doing something that bothered him. He won't now say what it was. He now claims, for a lot of political reasons, he's trying to get way out of this case. Um, but they caught pictures of someone who would appear to be uh, Ahmad Arbery, they didn't know at the time, uh, four different times inside that house, three times at night. The son had seen someone like that entering the house, had called 911, but the person escaped. Flash forward to mid-February, middle of the day, a it's same neighborhood, they see Ahmad Arbery uh, going inside this same house. 
So a person across the street calls 911. Arbery sees it, takes off. The father and son uh, see the father, the ex-police officer, his son with him, see Aubrey running down the street, think that that's the guy that's been burglarizing their neighborhood. They even had a gun stolen from their truck uh, a month or so before. Hop in a truck, chase after him. Somebody else follows. They end up trying to trap Aubrey. Aubrey ends up trying to run around them. And at one point, the truck is stopped in the middle of the road. That's when Aubrey tries to go past them and then makes a 90-degree turn and attacks the son with the, who's holding a shotgun. Uh, it goes in an extended battle. The shotgun goes off. Aubrey dies. And initially, the prosecutor said this looked like a legitimate citizen's arrest, and it appears that the gun went off because Aubrey was pulling it at himself. He was trying to get it away from the son, but in the process, pulling it at himself. Now, further evidence has come out that both the son and the third person who was following in a car have a history of making racist comments and statements. So that's going to be part of the basis of the case. Uh, the, and basically, first, there's no prosecution because the prosecutor looks at it and says it looks like they had reasonable. In Georgia, this, is, this gives you an idea of the difference in state laws. In Georgia, they got broad definitions of citizen's arrest. Uh, so broad. I figured this out when I was a practicing lawyer in southeast Tennessee originally. Yeah. I had cases in North Georgia where Walmart and private companies could take out personal warrants against people they didn't like. And I was like, this can't be true. And I go down there. It turns out that's the way Georgia is. A person could take out a warrant and swear out their own oath. Uh, it's, it's, it's like 1850s law down there in Georgia. God bless them. Wow. Uh, so they have a broad citizen's arrest law. That's what happens. But to give you some context for that, there a person believes they're executing self-defense that's allowed specifically under Georgia state citizen's arrest laws, which are very broad, allow you to arrest anyone. Uh, to give you an idea of your potential defenses, if you have a citizen's arrest law in your state, then if you have reasonable suspicion uh, of a crime, you can arrest person and use whatever force is necessary, including lethal force, to execute the arrest if necessary. So like Georgia even has a provision that you can do that if the person is an escaping felon, things like that. So those laws have a big impact on what you can do in, in a, when a rioting and looting occur. Um, but it varies by state. There's some states that have no citizens arrest authorities. There's some state laws that allow have stand your ground laws that say you don't have to retreat, you don't have to bounce back. There's others that don't. That's so in Florida, the Zimmerman case, a uh, Travion Martin case, was all about stand your ground. Uh, but there are several states he wouldn't have had that defense available to him, even when he was on the ground with his head being bashed into the ground. Uh, there's various states that have self-defense laws, but there's other states whose self-defense laws are kind of a joke. I'll give you an example. Oregon. I defended a little journalist guy. We have the case up on the Supreme Court. I took over the case after he'd been convicted. He was maybe 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, little guy. Uh, he had been beat up before by Antifa, uh, and in, which is very big in Portland. Project Veritas yeah. just did a big expose on him. Um, and they come from the black bloc. And, and actually, you'll see them all around the world. They're, they've been international really since the 70s. Uh, they've been in Mexico City. They've been in Brazil. They're, they're probably... I don't know if they're in Colombia because they might offend some other folks in Colombia if they try to get active. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, uh, that's where there's utility to those kind of things at times. Uh, it's like the old days, the Italian mob, whatever neighborhood they operated in was your safest neighborhood because ain't nobody, right. gonna, nobody was going to go in and yeah, riot I'm, in there. Yeah, I'm going to give a quick plug to Thomas Sowell. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've read several oh, yeah. of his books, but but right now, guys, if, if you're trying to figure out what's going on, and I think, Robert, to your point, when we see something at surface level that seems very cut and dry, often it's incredibly complex. So I always warn people, don't look for simple answers or simple solutions to things that are extremely complex because you're going to make things even worse. And I think nobody illustrates this better in his writings than Thomas Sowell. If you're going to go out and read some books right now, make sure you, you add Thomas Sowell to the list. So I just wanted to mention that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because I have a whole thing dealing with BLM and how they've made things more difficult and, and not really a civil rights organization. They view it as police abuse as a pretext to destroy America. In their view, America's bad, the government's bad, the society's bad, the history's bad. So it's a neo-Marxist perspective. Um, but they're not at all rooted in the civil rights tradition within America, which is heavily rooted in the African-American church, the African-American business community, civil rights lawyers and policy analysts, none of whom can get anywhere near the board of BLM. 
uh, BLM doesn't want anything to do with them because the, they see this as an opportunity. And this is why people are looking at it saying, well, why aren't they uh, maintaining peaceable protests? Because people forget how extraordinary what King and X did, even though people have their own views about both of them. They both maintained completely peaceful protests in very difficult circumstances. And they did hundreds of protests all across the nation. They, those protests never, there are no film, uh, you, you won't go and uh, you know, Google or uh, do a YouTube search of the MLK riots. Uh, and it's only the riots that happened after he died. There are no MLK riots. Well, MLK protest riots don't exist. Malcolm X protest riots don't exist uh, because they're rooted in their local religious community. The Protestant church in the case of King, the Nation of Islam in the case of X. Uh, local businesses were critically part of their infrastructure. They had civil rights lawyers that were part of their team, policy analysts that were part of their team. Uh, and so they were about civil rights reform. They're also all about self-empowerment. You know, uh, Malcolm X, is, no Malcolm X protest ever would have burned a single business in Harlem or people would have faced consequences. Uh, this, the, and so that gives you an idea that what's happening now is motivated by Trump, motivated by uh, international politics, it's not motivated by the incidents of George Floyd. In fact, if anything, because George Floyd could be a uniting event, they decided to pursue a divisive case. Uh, and I know this from, I do civil rights cases all across the country, I've done them for 20 plus years. Whenever somebody comes at me, when I question BLM or other organizations, I just point out I've done more civil rights cases, including particularly in the African American community, and haven't been bashful at calling out racism. I got some heat for it in the Wesley Snipes case in Florida in 2008, but it was the reality of it. Just to clarify, Robert, this is where you're representing people. Yes. Civil rights. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. So I bring civil rights. I, I go after corrupt governments, corrupt politicians, corrupt police, corrupt sheriffs, corrupt uh, prosecutors all the time. I probably do it more than 99.9% .9 of U.S. lawyers have done it for more than 20 years, have won a lot of cases in it. I uh, have a bunch of cases right now dealing with Milwaukee police, Milwaukee County jail system, trying to institutionally reform it through a large number of suits that we brought, have done the same in Tennessee, California, and multiple states. In New York, uh, I actually brought a case for Wesley Snipes that was a civil rights case involving the abuse of family court in New York. They're actually trying to do an Interpol warrant on a crazy, crazy case, long story. But the, uh, uh, but the whole nature of it is, if you're really concerned with civil rights cases, you know where how to reform, and you want to universalize your cases. You want people to recognize this can happen to anyone. You know, there's twice as many white unarmed people were shot by white cops last year than African Americans. We need to recognize that police abuse is a universal problem. When the government gets too much power or we give it into one single individual, the probability uh, that that leads to something bad is high. It's why I, I tell people I have, where I learned my quasi-anarchistic, uh, pure libertarian political viewpoints in part <laughs> was realizing as a high school student, I went to this program called Governor's School in Tennessee, and they put us in a room where basically we exchange, they're actually teaching us about currency. I just didn't realize it at the time. They're creating us like little bogus, little fake dollar bills, and we could do crazy things with them, so on and so forth. There was some radical who somehow snuck into the Governor's School program to tutor all these young teenagers uh, in sort of radical populist libertarian ideas. Um, but the other was recognizing of the hundred of us in the room, we were going to end up having four of us who are going to get to govern the rest of us. Right. And I realized, what's the likelihood that four of us turn out to be the good four of us? You know, it's going to be the sociopaths who seek and obtain the power. The same is true of police. Most police, good, clean, not a problem, want to help their community, et cetera. But if you're a sociopath, what better job than to be in the police? Right. If you love to abuse power, if you have a violent streak you want to use, and you then you now you have a badge and a gun and moral and legal permission to exercise it, it's going. The police can't cure the fact that they're going to disproportionately attract the wrong kind of personality. I use the same argument for politicians all yeah. the time. It's not the best of us who seek those positions, unfortunately, and it's definitely not going to be the best of us who get them because the tactics and techniques necessary to obtain the position of power yeah. is what leads to the problematic aspect. So the so you have that throughout the police. And so in that context, so uh, returning to the legal issues, you're going to have legal issues. It's all going to depend on where you live. Uh, it's, it's also going to depend on the politicians that make decisions, because it's what a judge does, what a prosecutor judge does, what a jury does, what the opposing counsel does. There's a reason why Antifa and these riots are almost all happening in democratic cities. You're not, they're not going to rural Alabama and trying to do it right. Uh, they're not going to rural Tennessee and trying to do it right. In my, even in my hometown in Chattanooga, they're staying out. 
They'll do it in Nashville because Nashville is a liberal Democratic town. They are purposely choosing Democratic liberal towns where they believe a combination of the police and the prosecutors and the jurors and the judges will never do anything bad to them. Nice. And that, in fact, getting reinforced in St. Louis, uh, the, the St. Louis prosecutor who was, a, uh, was part of a ticket that was put into power. Uh, for example, George Soros decided two years ago that he was going to help influence part of a liberal campaign, take over DA's offices all across the country. You have hardcore lefties in the DA's position in Philadelphia and San Francisco, people who don't even really believe in uh, a wide range of policing behavior, uh, who see their role as very uh, ends justify the means. And so for them, unleashing the mob is a tool they want to have. They see that as power that they want to have. So they don't want to discipline the mob. They don't want to control the mob. They want to unleash the mob. So if you like going back to that uh, Portland, Oregon case I had, a little guy, he's a journalist. He goes and covers rallies. He'd been beat up before by a big group of Antifa. He's, you know, he's diagnosed Asperger's. He's going, so the, uh, he's going out to another uh, Antifa rally and, and filming it. They see him. They decide to come after him. Well, in the lap between the time he'd been beat up before and that rally, he had got himself a gun, learned how to defend himself, got professional training, and he exercises it to a T. He sees them all coming. He, he walks back. Shows them the gun, brandishes it like this, then puts it right away, and they stop. What do the police do? The police are told to arrest him. They arrest him and charge him with endangering others, 17 different counts. Can't get a clean jury. He has a local lawyer that doesn't understand how political the case is. The judge is biased against him and issues a, uh, and convicts him. So him for trying to defend himself against this mob violence, it would be like if a, someone who they attempted to lynch in the 1930s managed to defend themselves, and they arrested him for defending himself against getting lynched. Right. Uh, but that tells you how political these places are. And the law, in the end, becomes political. It's just politics by other means. And so that's where a lot of people's ability to defend themselves and protect themselves is going to depend on where they are. I've been advising clients now for 10 years to get out of democratic states, get out of democratic cities. They're becoming overtly political. They're not like your classic uh, you know, ponytail lefties of the 1960s. They're not civil liberties guys. They don't believe in independence. They don't believe in freedom. They don't believe in any of those aspects. To them, their goal is power. And their goal is to obtain power by any means possible. And they've grown up on a very different ideology. And so they see everything through a power filter, a power frame. And so consequently, what the law says on the books as to self-defense may not apply as it didn't for that guy in Portland, Oregon. And that was as good a case as you could have. He didn't actually harm anyone. He was a little fella. Uh, he did exactly what the training said, and yet he still got prosecuted. So I think it's all going to depend on, I, I think some business people are starting to realize it yeah. because now you've seen some business people try to defend their business and they themselves, because they didn't recognize the number game, got beat up and assaulted. The only people who have been able to successfully defend their business, people with guns. Uh, that everybody respects. That everybody backs off on. But if they see you out there, a guy with a sword, he got the living daylights beat out of him. Guy tried to come out with a bat. He got, I mean, in Santa Monica, I lived a long time in that part of Santa Monica. It was totally shocking to see those scenes. I had a buddy of mine that is a restaurant owner right there. It's owned a, his dad owned an old school Greek diner. He converted into a high end Greek restaurant. He actually witnessed, and he lived in, in the tonier parts near Montana Avenue, the real nice parts. His mom lives up there. He's just driving down the street, and he sees six guys going in to burglarize the CVS, and he sees they have equipment to set it on fire. And he's like, what the heck? And he turns around, and he sees that the license plate has been blacked out, so that this is a sophisticated operation. Like, I think one place we may see lawsuits will be tricky about how to sue, because groups like BLM and Antifa are just very loose in their organizational structure. They don't keep their resources in a uh, LLC. They're better organized than people who are who are trying to dodge the tax man in terms of legal liability. They know how to, how to hide. Um, and, but I think uh, BLM knew at this point that their protests were being used and hijacked for violent purposes. But to give you an idea how sophisticated it is, Vice uh, was, was uh, filming uh, something, I'll have to put it that way, because if I say it in a certain way, somehow Google algorithms will come in and get, get rid of the, they'll say there's a copyright strike because they think, well, we included the Vice media coverage, but we didn't. But what Vice did is, uh, uh, they filmed in Minneapolis and where there was a protest happening here. And then they capture 
that a group has broken off to commit a robbery at the Wells Fargo. And it's like eight guys with sophisticated equipment to break into the ATM machines. And I was like, okay, so they're actually, they infiltrate and look like the protesters. And BLM is helping by how they're choosing to protest. Antifa, of course, definitely helps because they dress like Antifa and the all black originates. The words black bloc originates from a tactic used by a group in the 1970s in Germany. And then they became known as the black bloc because they dress in all black. And the, in part for intimidation, you have all these people in these all black ninja like outfits. But the other part, their practical part, part is it shows their criminal intention because their goal is to be able to commit crime and not be identified. That anybody within the group can go out and do something, come back within the group, police can't figure out who it was who did it. Uh, and it became a very, it's why Antifa spread so fast. Once the mindset took off, the black bloc tactic was a very popular one uh, that could, because it allowed people to be criminals without consequence. And not only that, it allowed them to be, it gave them a moral permission slip. Like I studied the Klan a lot as a kid, and once you dig into it, you realize most of the Klansmen weren't so much uh, driven by like a racist ideology. They're just a bunch of sociopathic criminals that somebody came along and said, here's your permission slip to go out and can act on your sociopathology. Right. It's like what you find in a lot of like radical Islamic terrorists. There's a reason why those cells re recruit from prisons. They're recruiting people who just want to act out that violent urge. But they're like, you know what? All I want you to do it. And so, OK, that's how they that's why they, it's, it's not a coincidence. So many of these guys and that they cut like the, the Belgium terrorists, the rest, they met in prison. It's like it's not just because they met in prison, got organized in prison. It's because they had the kind of mindset that led them to prison in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and Antifa has done the same thing. So they got some of your most violent, dangerous biker gang kind of personalities. And they just said, hey, you're fighting the fascists. You're fighting Hitler. You're fighting the Nazis. Here's your permission slip to go out and take care of these people. And it helps green light their criminal Im impulses. They're also much better organized than people recognize. That's how they were able to bring all these riots on mass scale. I think you will see federal criminal action to try to get at them. Uh, and I think you'll try, you'll see some civil suits try to get at people responsible. But I think it will be tricky because of the way in which they're so elastic. It's hard to say this person is responsible for that other person's conduct. It's hard to go to a collective asset and TIFA, actually, to a certain degree, if you want to learn how to protect your assets and minimize, minimize liability while engaging in mass criminality, not something I recommend, but yeah, I recommend asset protection. I don't recommend the criminality part. Right. Uh, but the way Antifa is organized is actually very effective. Very hard to, they're like jello. You, know, you push here and it goes over there. So it's very hard for them to, to they're even very careful about how they recruit. They use CIA tactics and how they recruit people. They're, they're actually better in certain respects than many uh, governments are at how they are able to limit their track record. Don't but, allow, et cetera. But you're, you're talking about prosecuting the group as a whole, I, I think. Yes. Why is it hard to prosecute individuals within the group? And just to, to go back a little bit further, just to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. So you've got these groups that are recruiting, let's call them some bad individuals. They're, who knows if there's good individuals? I'm not here to to lay judgment on that, but they're definitely recruiting some bad individuals. Is it that combined with, let's say I'm a criminal and I just want, I just want to steal stuff. And so I see this group of people, maybe peacefully protesting down the street. Maybe they're all wearing black, whatever, but then I go ahead and throw on my black uh, gear, let's call it. And I go to, Oh, if I just sneak in with them and then I go rob this Wells Fargo, then it seems like it was part of this group when really I could care less about the group. I just want to go out there and steal stuff. Is, is am I hearing yes. that correctly? Yeah. And, and yes, exactly. And I think what's interesting here is that it, it appears that the uh, looters and the arsonists, uh, and particularly the high end burglars knew where the marchers were going to march. Um, uh, and that's what led me to believe, like it was two things that why I hold a lot of the protest organizers responsible. One, every protest, I mean, I was, I've been involved in a lot of protest organization going back 30 years. We all know of this risk. So we all know of, hey, look, people are going to try to infiltrate, cause problems. Sometimes they're on the opposite side and just want to make us look bad. So we have strict discipline. And the way you impose that strict discipline is you use local people. So if you have the local pastor, the local businessman, the, lo the local boxing club owner. If those guys are part of your march, ain't nobody getting out of line because people are going to know who that is and they're going to personally handle it internally. That goes back to what MLK and Malcolm X did. 
Yeah. Exactly. They, they mastered the art. Because if there was any time for things to get crazy, it was the 1950s and 1960s. I mean, right. you're marching down the street and there's uh, sicking dogs on little kids. I mean, they were blowing up churches with little girls inside. Uh, so if there was any time to lose your mind, that was it. And yet it never happened at a single protest in either Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. And they had hundreds of them across the country. People think of Malcolm X as New York. He traveled all the time. Uh, and so that's because of they, but they knew how to exercise internal discipline and internal control. And they're also all about black self-empowerment. They were about take your money out of the big banks and give it to the local black bank, give it to the local community bank where you know the guy. Look, go to the person you know, reward them, protect them, empower yourself, keep capital within your own community, reinvest it within your own community. Both were huge on that. Um, whereas BLM never talks about it, which is and a little- go burn it down. Exactly. Whereas uh, uh, these new groups don't have that goal or objective, don't have those institutions or individuals involved. In fact, the founders of BLM are anti-black church for their own reasons. They follow, several of them follow us out of Nigerian sect and things like this. But they have personal host hostility and animosity to the black church. So that's why the, I was telling people in advance, this is not going to look like old school protest. Uh, these are organizations that have a very different objective in mind. They are not bothered at all by violence. And once I saw the Vice video, I was like, those eight guys came prepared to rob that Wells Fargo. So they must have known where the march was, even though there was no petition to legally allow the march. So no march route was scheduled. It's not like uh, JFK 1963, where you know what the, what the route's supposed to be in November in Dallas. They, they had no way to know what that march was unless they knew the organizers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, OK, so maybe the organizers aren't involved at all. But it would not be inconsistent if you understand their mindset. Their view is we got to use this to destroy the system. We got to tear it all down. It's very much like 18th century French Revolution mindset, where change, 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 abolish the past. All about abolishing the past. It's not a, as Gary Wills or others would argue, it's not. Both Mar uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were rooted in the past. They appeal to certain aspects of the past to change the future. These guys are completely different. They believe in abolishing the past. So it's like communist revolutions, like French revolutions, burn it all down, blow it all up. It's, I would say the best analogy for people that uh, maybe from Latin America or know Latin American history is the shining path. It, it's that kind of mindset, like the shining path movement in Bolivia, wonderfully captured in the film Dancer Upstairs. Um, so the, I think that, so dealing with that mindset, they're going to keep trying to do this. They're not going to stop. And if, when St. Louis, the local prosecutor, let him out without even bail, apparently. She, they walked in and she Im immediately had everyone that had been arrested for rioting and looting and arson and assault and released right away, right back onto the streets the same night. Uh, that's happening in other locations. So when you have a political app, you have the, the, the attorney general from Minnesota, you know, he, he, he flashed the Antifa book as a book he was proud of. Uh, his son, who is a city, has a city political power in Minneapolis who is now calling for destroying the police, defunding it entirely, taking away all police forces. And, and, and it's, it's something that you couldn't even imagine. If I would have told you there's going to be serious politicians, including congressional members of Congress, city councilmen, mayors, talking about defunding their police, the number one thing you do is the city. I, people said, no, that's, that's just too nuts. But that has, in fact, been the only policy objective that BLM has announced in the last three years that I've seen. What are they suggesting replacing it with? Just nothing? Yeah, that's the implication. They, 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 don't, they just say defund the police. And it's like, okay, then what? Then we're not going to have policing? So the mayor of L.A. just said he's going to cut L.A.'s police budget by at least 10%, maybe more. That he's going to shut down their gang task force. I mean, at South at L.A., it's not just South Central L.A. that has the gangs. And those gangs go back. Those are the oldest gangs really in America and the African-American side to some degree. They go back to the 1940s, 1950s. Originally started out groups like the Rolling Sixties and others. Uh, I had to be careful who I used to represent down there because there's the Crips and the Bloods and they all get mad at each other. So I was dead of it. Um, the, but the whole dynamic of that uh, is that the gangs are not only very powerful there. In East L.A., in fact, the gangs that run the Metropolitan Detention Center in Los Angeles are Central American gangs. Not even the Mexican gangs. The Mexican gangs are actually manageable. MS-13 and the Central American gangs are just crazy. They are just a whole different animal. And, well, you're familiar with Latin America and Central America, so you understand the context better than most Americans. If you grew up in 50, 60, 70 years of violence, like people in Guatemala and Honduras did, uh, because these problems go all the way back to then, the gangs formed sort of like the Sicilian mob. 
They formed as a response to constant invasions. There they, re they formed as a response to constant civil war. You have a culture where people are used to being a gang member by the age of eight. Uh, <clears throat> and they resorted to more and more extreme violence to get power. They're people without limits. Now LA is gonna shut down its attempts to control gangs? I mean, this is insanity. So the, now my buddy that's got his longstanding restaurant there, he can't really move, right? He's got, he's got 50 years of collective goodwill between he and his dad at that place. Right. Uh, but he's got to take protective precautions. He's got to figure out what insurance he can get. Uh, what other forms of, uh, what, what can he do to protect himself without becoming liable? Because LA is one of those places, it's tough. Like they don't, they, the self-defense laws are decent. A lot of self-defense is rooted arguably in the second amendment. So I've argued that everybody has a self-defense right under the U.S. Constitution. And the Supreme Court kind of acknowledged that when they said that the right to own a gun is really a right of self-defense under the Second Amendment. So my view is that is constitutionally protected against any criminal prosecution anywhere. But beyond that, a lot of cities and counties and states don't have stand your ground laws, don't have, uh, uh, don't have good citizens arrest laws. Don't allow you to really take the law into your own hands. So, Robert, let, let me let me just stop you right there just for a second here. Yeah, because I want to if, if I'm a business owner, just an ordinary citizen and I'm looking around saying, OK, number one, it's probably time for me to get a gun and to use it responsibly and just to, you know, hold it there. Just, you know, what's my what's my downside there? Probably not much. But then I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, I'm hearing Robert talk about all these risks if I actually do defend myself. So I guess my first question would be, how do I find out, this is a normal person and not a lawyer, how do I find out what the laws are in my particular state and city? And then how do I find out how fluid <laughs> they are <laughs> based on the, the local politics? And then I guess my, my last question here to round off the thought would be if you are someone like your good buddy who is just in a horrible situation where they've got a brick and mortar location, they've busted their butt to, to build up this brand equity so they can't move it, but they're in a jurisdiction that is very unfriendly to, let's say, business owners uh, defending themselves with firearms, um, th then what on earth do you do? So really it's sort of a threefold approach. In terms of self-educating uh, yourself on the law, there's three sort of search terms that are the most useful. One would be self-defense and then your city or county. The second would be stand your ground, your right. city or your county or your state. And uh, the, the, the third would be citizen's arrest in your city. Because I, I've told people that actually the citizen's arrest laws really allow a lot of room because they clothe someone in the power of being a policeman. So even if you don't have a stand your ground law and you have a weak self-defense law, if you have a robust citizen's arrest, and a lot of these cities, counties, or states have just left their citizen's arrest laws on the books. And the reason is because they're protecting security guards. So there's actually a very expansive protection. The judicial system has wanted to protect security guards at malls and private stores. And so they've expanded what you can do. So to give an example, reasonable suspicion that someone has committed a crime can be what somebody else reliably told you. Uh, so because that's what happens in most security guard contexts. The clerk says, hey, I think I saw something. They go and arrest him. And in order to avoid a false imprisonment charge, they say that that was reasonable suspicion to commit a citizen's arrest. So you could probably also look at that fourth component too, in case for whatever reason, citizen's arrest doesn't pop up in your local or state laws, look up uh, what the con rules are and the defenses are to false imprisonment. Okay. Because if you have citizen's arrest power, then you often have the power to use any force necessary to execute that. Uh, and that, that creates its own legal defense system that even if the self-defense law, like for example, one big difference, if you're in Texas, you can defend your property and you can use lethal force to defend your property. In uh, other states, you cannot. You can only use legal for, uh, force if you are in imminent risk of great bodily harm. And so like if you're the Koreans on top of the on top of the roof, ah. you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time. You're you're in imminent bodily harm. Uh, and the now, by the way, they didn't prosecute a lot of those guys because of political reasons. Um, but the but if you were a white uh, shop owner, it probably won't you won't get the same treatment these days. So there was they didn't want to offend the Korean community, and and uh, which is very substantial in L.A. Um, and that's where the politics factors in. 
The but like if I so that's part one is to to, to know your law. Look at citizens' arrest laws because those may be really protective more so than some other ones. The second, in terms of what you can do, uh, I definitely uh, everybody should have a gun. Uh, I was telling my daughter that just the other day, uh, and also get some self-defense training uh, yeah. in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, but and also get good training on how to use the gun. There's there's plenty of great trainers out there who'll teach you. Here's how you defend yourself. Here's how you stay safe. Here's how you make sure there's no collateral risk or exposure, and both a handgun and then I would have a big scary looking gun. Your goal with a big scary gun is never to use it. Uh, but it's like what uh, Tim Pool recently said. He was used to be against guns. Then he had somebody try to break into his house at 4 p.m. 4 a.m. Mm. And the cops showed up and they said, look, realistically, it's always going to be a delayed response time. What we recommend is you get a shotgun. Because when you open the door with a shotgun, people suddenly decide they don't want to burglarize your house much. Right. And if you look at what's been happening in the riots, handguns, sometimes people have tried to do something with. But when they see somebody pull out a big gun, uh, like those guys outside of that shop in New York, they went, there was like three of them with huge guns. Uh, those guys wanted to raid that place and were saying all kinds of stuff to them, but they weren't going to take their chances with that big gun. Uh, the, there was another guy who, who directed people out. No, there was one guy who was a cigar shop owner. He had a regular handgun, but he clearly knew how to use it. He had it very secured, and it's pretty, it looked like a Texas Ranger, and he got walked everybody out of the store. Made sure to maintain physical distance so they couldn't grab it or anything go sideways. Uh, what happened in the Arbery case is he didn't maintain enough distance from Arbery uh, to, to, to pr protect himself as part of the reason why he's being criminally prosecuted. Also, it didn't help that he's a racist. So, you know, at least according yeah. to the allegations. Um, so the uh, but you look. So those are all aspects you can do. So now here's the hard part. A lot of cities, counties and states right now. And this is why I tell people as soon as you can get a gun, always get one because you never know what the laws are going to be. And all of these Democratic governments are very sophisticated at knowing how to prevent you from getting a gun, even though it's not on the book legally. It's sort of like being an African-American trying to register to vote in 1940s Mississippi. Yeah, on the books, you're allowed to. Somehow, just the machine never lets it happen. Mm -hmm. So there's they've used the pandemic as a pretext to shut down a lot of... The, originally, they tried to shut down gun stores. Then they got a lot of lawsuits, a lot of pushback, and so they stepped back and said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let gun stores stay open. But then they took a second step, which was they just shut down the background check departments. They're like, ah, you know, that's not really essential within the government right now to have a. So what happens is you go apply for a gun in the United States, contrary to what you know, some on the left and some others make it sound like you can get a gun easily. Uh, if you want to get a gun illegally, you can get it easily, like you can almost anywhere in the world. But if you want to get it legally, you have to go through a background check process. There's a waiting period, time period. And they're slowing that process down all across the country in Democratic states right now. There's people that have applied for guns months ago that still haven't got their background check cleared. Um, and so it's a it's a politicized process that they're doing. Now, what you can always do is you can go to a different state that has more liberalized laws and a cleaner, quicker process and thereby get a gun. Um, but, yeah, you, absolutely, people should. The last step is I when I look at it from a political perspective, what I always recommend to people is you and whoever's. First of all, I recommend that if you can, hire professional security rather than do this yourself. Uh, hire people that have been in okay. Absolutely. It. Especially during these kind of moments. Because yeah. it, you know anybody that hasn't been through it, the chance of something going sideways is always high. Mm -hmm. The risk is just too disproportionate. So hire people. There's plenty of ex-vets who work in private security who, for them, this, this is small change. You know, this is this yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, this is one, Iraq. I mean, this is child play. <laughs> exactly, exactly. If you've been through those kind of behaviors, those kind of circumstances, uh, you, you're not worried about some kids wanting to break into the store. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about landmines. You don't have to worry about air bombs. You don't have to worry about any of this. You don't have to worry about chemical weapons, et cetera. So, the, uh, so those guys will know what they're doing. Usually a team, two to four people is ideal. Uh, and the, and uh, you only would call upon them in times of emergency, but to have them available for you in times of emergency like this, uh, they'll usually have uh, protective gear on. Uh, and those guys, in fact, this has happened uh, in Minneapolis. It's happened in some other places where they've hired these guys. They know how to patrol the roofs. They know how to patrol the front of the building. Nobody has touched those buildings at all because the criminal gangs that are part of it, you have unsophisticated criminality that simply crimes of opportunities taken place in terms of arson and looting. But what's really unique about these sets of riots 
is there are criminal gangs targeting institutions for money, targeting high-end stores in Santa Monica, high-end stores in New York City, going in and doing a, a bus. You know, they're robbing diamond stores. They're robbing Gucci. They're robbing Louis Vuitton. You know, the, uh, they're robbing Cartier. They're robbing Dior <clears throat> and, and robbing banks. I mean, there was my favorite version is the guy who somehow got a whole ATM off the ground and tried to carry it onto a bus, <laughs> and the bus driver, a public bus, and the bus driver was like, uh, "No," and and, he, and he's complaining, he's like, "Man, we," and, and you see the bus driver pulling off, and the guy's complaining, "We could have been rich together, buddy. We could have been rich together." This is the mindset that's going on out there. So wow. the your basic show of force will deter your crimes of opportunity. The second category you have to now worry about is the sophisticated criminal gangs using a protest as guys to go in and do high-end robberies, right. groups right. of four to eight people. For that, you just uh, uh, arm up. And because 95% of businesses are not doing this, your sophisticated gangs will be like, why go after the hard target when the easy target is next door? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how to do it. I would also recommend hiring racially diverse staff, uh, security guards, if you can. So if you have an African-American security guard, Latino security guard, uh, the, then it changes the political equation. If something goes south, if these guys have to defend themselves and they end up shooting someone in, in your store and you're subject to liability, if you have an African-American or Latino that were part of that security team, just as a political matter, as a matter of optics, you're going to be in much better shape. Uh, so that's what I've advised people as to the stage of steps to take. The, the, there's also basic protocols that people can impose in terms of blocking their windows, not with cardboard. Ideally, they have metal that they block those windows. I mean, they do this in European stores and lots of other stores where you just uh, impose something, you create the infrastructure to do it. And businesses, if you're gonna, if, business, if a business is gonna be located in these democratic cities, just create security structures where you can push down a very secure, uh, well, you can always have more secure glass, by the way, people forget that. They're starting to see that as, you see these people that try to bash in some windows, they don't get bashed at all. Other windows bash easily. It's the quality of the glass that was used. Right. Yeah. But assuming you don't, so if you're doing new construction or something like that, like my a restaurant buddy, he put in very uh, high-end quality glass when he reconstructed about five years ago. Uh, in part, uh, not focused on this, either for other reasons too, aesthetically, uh, but it was also just an additional security protocol. Because when you're out on the, you have a little restaurant out in the street, at any time, somebody randomly could just get the inspired idea. They don't need a riot or a loot, a, a right. rioting opportunity to do so. So that's the other ways they can protect themselves. And then last but not least, jurisdictionally diversify, of course, both in terms of your assets and your citizenship. You know, the, uh, the, it was the old line from the movie Heat. Uh, the line from the movie Heat was, never have anything in your life that you can't walk out on in 15 seconds flat if you feel the heat around the corner. I used to tell people, have yourself prepared so that if you need to walk out in 15 seconds flat, you can disappear and be somewhere else politically protected and economically protected immediately. And that requires things like multiple citizenships, that requires multiple passports, that requires assets in multiple locations, physically outside of the domestic United States, and definitely outside of a particular city, county, or state. Where I mean, this has shown, if Minneapolis could run the country, the police would be eliminated next week, according to the city council. Imagine, you know, so when we live in that kind of environment uh, and the other thing to understand about the BLM in part, but also especially Antifa, they heavily believe that insurrectionary moments can change the world overnight. They believe things they've looked at history and they say history can change in 24 hours. So the now I think they're, they overstate what can happen in terms of their own power and capacity, but we can't rule it out. We just saw a lockdown across all you know, a, a response of politicians that they've never done before in response to a flu epidemic that uh, completely damaged a whole bunch of businesses that may never recover, in part because they never particularly planned for it. Even the few that did have insurance companies refusing to pay them. Uh, you know, if they had had if they had had a captive insurance, then they would be better protected because that would have been their own money put a, put aside for this precise position with tax advantages that allow that monies to grow and outside the United States, so it can be jurisdictionally diversified where they can pr pursue investments that the SEC may not even allow within the US. So the, uh, those opportunities to, to have all the advantages of a born identity kind of plan yeah. in place also makes it so if I lose this restaurant, if this goes down, if I lose my house here, it's not the end of the world for me. If things get really crazy, I can hop a boat, I can hop a plane, I can hop a car and be out of Dodge and in some place safe and still be economically stable and not starving. Yeah, you know, I've, I've discussed that quite a bit 
actually in my last few videos just because of what's going on. And I've been telling people, and I try to break it down into categories, people who don't want to leave the United States, people who might have a little bit more flexibility. But even for people who don't want to leave the United States, what's your downside of actually just having a passport? Let's just start there. I would say 50% of Americans don't have one. So if you can just start by getting a passport, and then I would say in addition to that, why not get an RV and just park it in your driveway and maybe have a, a good old-fashioned diesel truck? So if this stuff starts to happen, you can just get in your RV. It's loaded with food. Go up to the mountains. Go to the lake. Enjoy yourself and just watch it from afar for a week, two weeks, two months, whatever, and then taking it to the next step, what's your downside of having a second passport, just like you're saying? And I, I think in my videos, some of the, the, the disconnect for most people was, well, why do I need a second passport if I just have like a visa, you know, if I, if I get a residency maybe in Panama? But what they're not understanding, and maybe you can shed some light on this, is right now it's actually very difficult for Americans to get in. Sure, you can leave. But a lot of countries don't want Americans because of, you know, whether you believe the numbers or not, the, 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 the media is telling us that the majority of the cases of COVID are in the United States. So I just read this. I was looking at real estate in Dubai as an example. And I saw that Dubai right now is opening up to tourists. If I read it correctly, they are not opening up to American tourists. And I think as Americans, we always just assume that we're wanted everywhere. Uh, and it's just those Russians and Chinese and Brazilians and uh, people in the Middle East. Well, you know, those are the people that need to, you know, they're, they're not wanted in the EU or uh, the United States, Canada, Australia. But we could be facing a situation, especially if we get a second wave of the virus, where Americans are now the kind of persona non grata. And that's why that second passport is so crucial, because you could get on that plane, you could get into that other country where you want to go using the alternate passport. So what, what I, so I'd like to know your thoughts on that. And then maybe how, how you're doing this in your own life, uh, in kind of preparing this way. Sure. So, I mean, I always tell people it's always good to have jurisdictional diversification because you don't want all of your assets, including your personhood, uh, solely within the power of one jurisdiction, because then you're dependent either on what that jurisdiction does or, as you note, how other people may respond to that jurisdiction. Yeah. So you, you don't want to be limited that way. And though I always give people the comparison. Imagine you're 1925. You're Jewish in Berlin. Things are actually going great. The Nazi Party only got 2.8 percent of the vote. You don't got to, the stock market's going boom, boom, boom. The Weimar Republic has recovered from its hyperinflation in the earlier years. Uh, it is, in fact, a, it's, it's Babylon, Berlin, in terms of the air, some of the greatest music and art taking place. And you think, I don't need a second citizenship. I don't need jurisdictional diversification. Well, 10 years later, your whole family's in a death camp and all your property is stolen. Yeah. So you, the, it's always that by governments fail and collapse. I think the number one thing people forget these days is things can change fast. And I think we've grown up in America so accustomed to not really recognizing that. Because in America, things often haven't changed that fast. But in the whole world and over human history, it does. And here, where I mean, like I was in a position where I had to go from Nevada to Texas uh, to get there before Texans shut me out from going just from Nevada to Texas. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about. It's not just uh, countries not allowing Americans in. It's certain states not allowing other Americans in from other states. I mean, exactly. that's when it gets really crazy. You had uh, in Texas, they lined up. I had to actually try to map it out if because someone else was going to come visit me uh, from Tennessee. Uh, and Tennessee was OK to come into Texas, but not Georgia. And so the problem is almost all flights go through Georgia. So I was like, no, you got to fly over here and then you got to fly down here just to avoid the self-quarantine order when you showed up because they had security right at the gate as soon as you got off saying if, if you came from any of those other locations. Um, and Texas was generally more chill about it. I mean, at times, Rhode Island and Rhode Island was actually going to block its border to not allow people from Connecticut and New York in. Uh, They're actually lining up state troopers to do so until New York threatened to sue and so forth. So that's the what took place. Uh, and that shows you how at any given moment the whole system can fall apart. And if you're dependent on only one permission slip from one country, 
or one city or one county or one state, you are at great risk. Yep. Uh, and it's not that expensive. And it was, as you noted in your most recent video, right now is a fantastic time to get second citizenships. Because of the pandemic, they have lowered prices dramatically. Mm. And there are very sophisticated law firms out there. Uh, there's a law firm that I use because they happen to hire a lot of ex-government officials from those Caribbean countries. Uh, so I find that second citizenship goes real fast. Uh, but it's what's fascinating to me is the, the original people who were big on second citizenship, there was a, a law firm that's set up that's an international law firm originally rooted in Switzerland. No surprise that part. Um, but they set up because they're, it's people who recognize the risks of their government or the risks that other people may have it because so it was overwhelmingly Chinese and Russians who were originally getting second citizenships. But like the other utility, like you look at, say, the St. Kitts passport, mm -hmm. the St. Kitts passport is part of the Schengen Agreement. So it gets the same permission to travel to and within Europe as a U.S. passport does. Yeah. So you have all the permission slips you need. The other thing people forget is, like I had a client who the reason why he got caught in Panama, well, there's, a, there's some other aspects. The government committed a lot of fraud, corruption. They lied. The embassy lied. They, helped, they bought off a person. All that crazy. I mean, it is a crazy story on that side of the aisle. But the only reason why he was in any kind of jam is because he got Panama residency, but he didn't go out and get a second passport. In fact, he was carrying around a bogus second passport. Now, th this is another reason to have a second passport. The risk at that time was kidnapping in Panama from uh, on the border because he was on one part of Panama was connected. To, uh, which border? I forget which one it was. But whatever it was, there was a history of them kidnapping people with a U.S. passport for the purposes of extortion and kidnapping and ransom. Uh, and he had a fake passport in another name. But he would have been much better off if he had a real passport in another name. Because then he could have uh, got out of the country without a problem. He, he ended up stuck in Panama, knowing the government was coming to try to grab him. And even though he thought legally the government couldn't, and he was right under the Panama extradition laws, that didn't matter because of the politics of Panama. And when he recognized that, he couldn't get out of Panama because he never went and got a second passport. A permission slip that allows you to get out of a port, allows you to get on a plane, allows you to pass a border in a car. Uh, I think it's the other thing people don't realize. Borders are so controlled these days. That unless you become very familiar in like jungle landscape, you know, they're essential in South America. If you if you don't mind living in the jungle, yeah, there's ways to cross some borders without a problem. But short of that, it's very, very difficult. So that's where it's critical. The way I always put it to people is I like the RV truck. I like being able to live off the land. I call that the downscale option, the midscale option. So sort of the uh, your, your low cost style. I always recommend have, you know, have a small shack out in the woods not uh, uh, titled in you, not recordable to you, and some entity, some you know, generic name, U.S. real estate, you can do that very easily. So it's how everybody organizes real estate. Uh, so have it effectively in a quote-unquote shell. Um, the, that, uh, but that's uh, independent, that has a generator, that doesn't rely upon any public utilities, has its own water well, has all your, you can be self-sufficient and off the grid tomorrow if you gotta be. Or if you just gotta wait out something like a crazy pandemic, or wait out something like a bunch of crazy riots, or wait out anything else that needs to occur. Uh, an RV is great for that because you can drive around physically and find those locations. Um, and, and, and trucks have multiple benefits in multiple contexts, particularly if you're off-road and yeah. need it for yeah, and, I, and I want to point out, too, because I know maybe some people are watching this saying, well, Robert, George, I get what you're saying, but why not just be a good citizen? And if I don't break the law, then I've got nothing to worry about. But remember and I'm talking to that viewer specifically, the part of the conversation when Robert and I were discussing what the law is and then kind of how there's this gray area based on what type of jurisdiction you're in and the political environment and the narrative in, the, in society, in the media. You don't have to do something, quote unquote, wrong by the law to be in a in a heap of trouble if you're just the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. Exactly. And ask almost anybody in a wide ranging set of populations over world history. Ask obviously the Jews of Germany. They didn't right. do anything wrong. Uh, ask the gypsies uh, who are also targeted by the Nazis, people who are simply labeled disabled who are targeted by the Nazis. But you could label any other group. Certain groups in Italy were targeted. Labor union activists were targeted just because the fascists didn't trust them, didn't like them. Lar there's been large parts of disappearances. In there's almost no part of the world that at some point hasn't had innocent people suffer in mass at the hands of either the mob or the state. And so I call it real life insurance. 
right? There's a life insurance that says maybe some company will pay your heirs when you die. And then there's a life insurance that keeps you alive when you need to. And the second thing I always recommend to people is have a car stashed somewhere uh, that you can get to. It's not entitled in your own name. Uh, in the back, have a, have a briefcase, a briefcase that has the most secure kind of laptop that can communicate in the securest form, a burner phone or phones as, as to the degree you need those, uh, a, uh, and then uh, various forms of currency that are reflected around the world. Ideally, now you can add Bitcoin to that equation and, and cyber currency. But all, you know, at least ha you know, these are for people who have some uh, resources or means, but it doesn't right. have to be tons. You know, you could have 10 grand and that'd be enough to survive to get out of Dodge. Uh, to get to the right place. But if you have the cash and capital and the means, have it. You know, the, there's a reason why El Chapo built a lot of tunnels from every home he lived in. He was preparing in advance and he got to live outside of prison for 20 plus years. Um, but you can do, you can build your own tunnels to avoid you being the victim of a governmental or mob mentality that may come for you. And I just call it a born plan. Hop in a car and in that, in that briefcase, you have all the means to communicate all the means to get wherever you need to get to. Uh, I would recommend people have jewels, people have some watches, physical things that people like to buy uh, that you can exchange in any parts of the world where uh, in case the currencies themselves fall apart. Uh, yeah, and one thing I wanna mention there, I think this goes back to our last conversation is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think gold jewelry has yes. never been confiscated or has never been made illegal by any of the governments, not just the United States, but when they did that in the UK, when they did that in Australia, I think gold jewelry was exempt. So that might be another thing that would be good to have in that uh, in that briefcase or in that trunk. Absolutely. Uh, there was an old movie uh, that of Robert Redford when he was in Cuba, and he uh, he had a diamond sewn into his body, uh, and he ended up coming to use it. But he had been the the person told him, "Look, if you he, he had learned it from someone else, his character had." and said, look, this is your insurance plan that you'll know as long as you have that, you'll be safe wherever you are in the world because you can always have one last attempt to get out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, and it, you know, the, they use it in a good, effective way in the film. So it's the same mindset. Uh, but for example, for the most part, depends on the rules, but like where if I have more than 10 grand and I fly outside the country, I got to report it. Or they could seize it. I mean, that's the real remedy. It's not necessarily it's a crime. They can just take all your money if you don't report it. Um, I remember I went through an airport when I was going over to London to bet on the elections, and I had like uh, about 150 grand in the, uh, in, the <laughs> in the book bag. And even though I was going through Vegas, and I used Vegas because Vegas is a useful place because a lot of cash goes in and out, yeah. so they're less shocked and startled. But the guy was still shocked, and he thought for sure I hadn't reported it. I was like, of course I reported it. I think I'm going to take this back through here and not have reported. Um, but if I'm carrying 150 thousand dollars, if I have 150 thousand uh, dollar uh, Patek Philippe watch on. Yeah. Don't have to report it. So the it's a way to it, you, you uh, stay under the radar screen. Uh, that's the utility of jewels. That's the utility. Watches can be great, particularly rare watches. There's that great movie, uh, uh, the, the French movie. Well, it was an English movie, but in France. I'm forgetting the name at the moment. But everything's about a stamp, the value of a stamp, because it's a rare stamp worth ridiculous sums of money. Hmm. So now th there's risks with things like stamps and baseball cards and some of the because you're really dependent on a market that might disappear. Um, but the, that's why I like gold. That's why I like jewels. That's why I like watches. Those are much easier. But small things that you can transport on your body that can protect you for life, uh, like Robert Redford's little diamond underneath uh, his skin. Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, I'm, I'm looking at my watch here. I know I've kept you over an hour. I sincerely appreciate your time. This is a fascinating conversation, Robert. I could talk about this for three hours. This is so cool. I really, really appreciate it. For uh, my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do or watch your show, uh, where can they go to, to learn more about what you do? Sure. They can. Uh, my firm's website is Barnes Law LLP, as in Peter, com, And then I do a show called American Countdown right now during this crazy era, pandemics, yeah. then riots. And then, we, of course, we got the election uh, and the American Countdown show. They can find it band dot video. Uh, the, so they can find that there. Also, I'm on Periscope on Twitter at Barnes underscore law. And so all of it. so the uh, it is a fascinating time to be alive. It sure is. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate your time again, and I cannot wait to uh, to to chat. Uh, let's do it soon. Absolutely. Thanks, man.